So I am really pleased to be here and uh, share some of my thoughts and ideas and some of the ideas of the State Preparation Preparedness Committee as we've uh, worked hard individually, privately, as well as coming together collectively to put some ideas together to help people. And tonight our focus is on food storage, kind of the basics. Um, I, I can tell you that one of the, as, as I'm doing, you know, getting out and about talking to people, one of the, uh, some of the objections that I hear is, I don't know how, I don't know where to start, where do I go from here, I don't have room to store it, why should we even do it, what, how much do I need? And so th those are a lot of the questions that we want to plow through today to show you what the guidance is and give you some ideas and, and, and hopefully as we go through here, have some ideas, uh, uh, share some ideas that, that we have. So um, food storage basic, this is an outline tonight of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about why. That's one of the big objections I run into is people don't understand why we're doing this. Uh, we're going to talk about the guidance, what's out there, and we're going to stick pretty close to what LDS.org and ProvidentLiving.org uh, has, as we'll see that unfold. And then we're going to get into some of the hows that we do this. So first we're going to talk about why. Again, some of these objections and why not. So nothing's going to happen. I don't believe the warnings are exaggerated. We have plenty of time to prepare. The second coming is a long way off. No recent mention. Um, it must not be that important. Well, I have money. I can buy what I, when I need it. I'm spiritually prepared, God will take care of me. I can't afford it right now, I'm too busy, I have no storage room, others will share. I know who has food and I have guns. Uh, the government will help and there's no more little family support or I have enough already. I mean, there's some mixture of all that that I've, that I've heard. And so, as we, um, as we think about that, maybe some of that resonates with you, I don't, I don't know. Um, hopefully not. Uh, most of that. But so here's <clears throat> here's some advice as we get doing this <clears throat> to understand your whys and maybe even your why nots. <clears throat> and to become informed, to read, collect ideas and learn skills. Just kind of be an open book and, and find like minded people, which is the bottom one here. Follow the guidance. Uh, we we want to talk about faith. It's not about fear or despair. We're not doing this out of a panic. We're doing it very rationally and one step in front of the other. Um, don't go to extremes or go into death. That's very clear um, from the church, is that we're not to be extreme about this or to be expensive, which we'll talk about later. And then take action and don't, don't be acted upon. Spiritual preparation. Um, there's a concept here about deserving to be blessed. I mean, there's, we, have, we could quote scriptures and, um, about uh, when we get blessings, it's because we obeyed some law. Uh, have a consecration mindset and spiritual preparation includes temporal preparation. Again, I've heard people say, well, I'm, I'm really focusing on temple family history, doing my calling, you know, and they have three weeks of food. I mean, they admit it. And it's like, well, that's not, that's not part of spiritual preparation. I mean, there's, a, there's a bigger uh, uh, landscape there. Uh, listen to your conscience and follow promptings. Be organized, make and use lists, and, and be together and like-minded. Um, around like-minded people. I think those are all important. Uh, this pearls before swine, I think is an important concept. Um, that doesn't say don't cast your pearls. It just says don't, pat, pat, uh, don't cast them in front of pearls. And so when we find a like-minded community, we can share, we can share our beliefs, we can share our, our, our stuff, but we need to be respectful of, of that as well and not take advantage of, of other people's status and so forth. Any questions on this? So find your why. Uh, right down here, um, this is Ezra Taft Benson. For nearly 6,000 years, God's held you in a reserve to make your appearance in the final days before the second coming of the Lord. God has saved for the final ending some of his strongest and most valiant children who will help bear off the kingdom triumphantly. That is where you come in, for you are the generation that must be prepared to meet your God. When you think about that, isn't everybody going to meet our God? So there's something different about this. There's a different meeting our God that he's talking about here. And I think this has, uh, this plays into the idea of what are we preparing for? And that's, that's an important question uh, to think about. It's like, what is it that we're preparing for? Obviously, time of need. This, is, we, this has been drilled into everybody, not just the church, but the government and 
FEMA and everything, you know, to, to have some supplies on hand in case there's natural disasters. Uh, if, there, if there's a lot of talk lately about the grid down situation, what if there's an EMP, a solar flare, or whatever? And it's like, what are you going to do? And, and how would you live for the next week or month or year if there was no electricity? Uh, we are also guided by our, our religious beliefs in terms of what we've been told, the, the guidance that we've been given uh, from the pulpit as well as other places. And then um, I, I operate a lot with the blessing side of it. Um, I don't believe, this is my personal belief, but I don't think that seagulls and manna are going to show up until about the 366th day, <laughs> if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay? I, we can't expect it to, let's put it that way. If we're in a situation where you know, it's un, untenable and we just couldn't have prepared, well then I'm sure, you know, I, I believe God would help us out there, but I don't think we can expect it and live like we, we can expect it because we we are righteous or something or we're, you know it's not going to happen so it's just kind of be thinking about that a little tongue in cheek there. this this well, law of multiplication the idea there is what if I've done my very best and I don't have enough I think we've got great examples uh, purposely put in the scriptures that talk to us about how what we have will multiply in some fashion question oh no I was you were going to the next page and you hadn't talked about that okay so thank was... you. I didn't know what it meant. Uh, for those who say, well, um, I'm unacquainted with, or I don't understand, or they haven't talked about it in a while, uh, the prophets or the leaders of the church, I, I have a document on the website, approachingready.com. Um, you can go there, and this, this is a 20, 30 page um, compilation of prophetic statements and church leader statements from the early days to the current about what there is. So it's like nobody can tell me that the church hasn't taught this or isn't still teaching this. Um, and just a few quick ones here. Uh, President uh, Benson, quoting uh, President Romney, says, forgotten by some of our members is an underlying principle of the church welfare plan that no true Latter-day Saint will, will physically able voluntary shift from himself <clears throat> the burden of his own support. <clears throat> Uh, J. Reuben Clark talks about let every head of household see that he has um, uh, on hand enough food and clothing and where possible fuel for at least a year ahead. Uh, President Benson uh, in a meeting was talking about a time when there wouldn't be a store, or, I'm sorry, President Kimball, when there wouldn't be a store. Uh, uh, Bishop Peterson was talking clear back in 1975 about uh, they estimate only 30% of the church has a two month supply of food. That's obviously dated. I don't know what the survey would show us today, but you get the That's point. About the same. It's probably the same or less, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, and, as, and we start thinking about this. Uh, President Benson had this what if thing, and I think this is a key concept when you're thinking about what do I do, what do I need, and that is just to start asking, well, what if? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if there's no store? What if there's no transportation? Uh, what if there's no electricity? Uh, what if I can't flush the toilet? What if I, you know, what if my food starts to this or that? Um, those are just uh, bring scenarios to mind about well, then how would I begin to solve those problems? Um, he talks about home production of food to learn to produce our own food, involve our family members, grow our own gardens, grow our food that is everything that you feasibly can on your own property. This is the this is our culture um, in the church that we've grown up with. Um, President Kimball also talked about um, um, how empty it is that they put their spirituality so-called into action and call him by his important names, but fail to do the things that he says. Really kind of calling us out to say, um, you can't give this lip service, and you can't let it just go by you. you really, if you're going to be converted, uh, you need to do all this. Again, to people who say, well, they haven't said anything recently. Well, here's President Monson in, in 2014 in the Enzyme. This was a message a home teaching message um, one month on uh, are we prepared and so we've, we've got very current information in my view. Uh, President um, Aldridge or Elder Aldridge says just as in the days of Noah a way is already prepared for the escape of the Lord's elect Latter-day Saints if they're in tune with his prophets. <clears throat> so again I just wanted to go through you know we have precedent, we have guidance, we have direction. Uh, we can't sit back and, and use those kind of excuses that 
that at least uh, within our church, in the LDS church, that we haven't been taught properly and correctly over the years. It is true that I personally am aware they haven't said a lot lately like they used to in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but I don't think that negates the council. I think I recall President Benson saying something to the effect of if you haven't done it by now, it might be too late or something, but you know, it's like, and, and some of the messaging changed, but the, the council and the guidance is still there. So relative to the guidance, um, I would just refer you to lds.org and providentliving.org. This is, this is where our guidance lives right now in our church. Uh, when you go to the providentliving.org, there's a food storage uh, section. There's a lot of other things as well, but there's a food storage, and that's where we're going to drill into this. Um, this is the statement that is on the site with regard to preparing every needful thing so that when adversity comes, we can take care of ourselves. We encourage members worldwide to prepare for adversity in life by having a basic supply of food and water and some money and savings. We ask that you be wise, not go to extremes. With careful planning, you can over time establish home storage supply and a financial reserve. That's the guidance. The problem with that is that on some of the places, um, we hear this, we see this written as a three month supply. And I think there's people that have come away from this thinking, well, that the church has changed its position. We don't need a year's supply anymore. I mean, how many of us are old enough to remember when they were talking two years' supply? Okay? And so now it's like, well, they, they're talking about a three month supply. And it's like, I, I, that, that's kind of nice. It's liberating. It's not as hard you know, to do that. But that's not really accurate. And I'll, and I'll show you why. So we have a three month supply, and then they talk about having a longer term supply, drinking water, and a financial reserve. We're not going to do the bottom two, we're just going to focus up in here. The three month supply is about building a small supply of food as part of your normal daily diet until it's sufficient for three months. My perspective on that is this is what I would call my pantry. I probably have enough food plus or minus in my pantry, just in the house, stuff on the shelf that I could, I could survive or subsist plus or minus for about three months, so that's that. Okay. So that's the three month part. Then the longer term supply, it says to build a supply to last a long time and can be used to stay alive. These are things that they, they on the website talk about, the wheat, the beans, these are the staples you know, that we talk about that can store for 30 plus years. So uh, the question is asked, this is again following the outline on uh, providentliving.org here, um, what am I supposed to have in my food storage? <clears throat> Again, I'm back to these three things. Food, three month and long term, water supply, and a financial reserve. We're just gonna focus on this right here. So we store foods that are part of your normal diet uh, in your three month supply as you develop longer term storage, focus on food staples, and it lists them. And then, and then it goes into the sub uh, category of longer term supplies, and it's like, what does that actually mean? Um, and this is where they start to define it. And we're going to follow this outline here in just a moment. But this is where they start to define that uh, very accurately. Each of you have, should have a page uh, that you picked on the table as you walked in. Uh, this is a link on Provident Living, LDS.org. And this is uh, the list. If you're, if you're asking the question, well, what do I need in 30 plus year food items for this longer term or year supply of food? This is where you would start, in my opinion. This has been prepared uh, out of the Ezra Taft Benson Institute of Agriculture, or whatever, BYU. And so they've gone through this and, and put this together. Uh, many or most of these things can also be purchased um, on the LDS uh, stores. So again, how much food storage do I need? Now, there's an algorithm that the LDS.org and Provident Living uh, site does, and I recognize that it's there because this is worldwide acceptable, accessible. So there's people in all countries, third world countries, that are trying to figure out how do they get a year's supply. And guess what they start with? Today. One day. Times it by seven, now you have a week. Times it by three or four, and you got a month. Times that by three, and you're, you're three months. So it's just a stepwise graduation of what, how do I get a three month supply? Take one day and times it by 90 days, and that's what you need for, it's a little elementary, I get that, but that's the concept here. Um, uh, for longer term needs and where permitted, gradually build a supply of food that will last a long time. 
But then when you go and you start, you, you click into the, uh, some of the links here, mormonnewsroom.org talks about a three month supply. So this is in the media now. And this is what it talks about. While a simple guideline suggesting the accumulation of a three month food supply and water supply falls into the overall church welfare philosophy of preparedness in every aspect of life. You can walk away from that and say, I need a three month supply. That's why it's on the site. <clears throat> Here's the difference. This is lds.org on the left, almost verbatim the same words on providentliving.org. If you read them, there's almost word for word, not quite. But over here on the right, we talk about where permitted, gradually build a one year supply. And over here it just says a, a food that will last a long time. A little more ambiguous. My point in this is that this is not about, I only have to get three months now. Our, our websites talk about a year's supply of food. So uh, there, there's your authority and people say, well, I don't need a year's supply anymore. That's not the guidance. It is the guidance in my and opinion. There's, and there's some countries where you cannot store a year's supply. You're not allowed to. And that's not that, the case here. And that might be part of the reasoning for the softening, you know, I don't know. Oh, that is actually yeah. part yeah. of the reasoning. Is what but, they, but, but be careful, don't go away from that and say, well, guess what? We don't need, you know, to be as engaged in this anymore. The next one is, I don't know where to store it. I don't have room. Where should I store my food storage? Uh, this, again, is right off the website. Make sure your food storage is properly packaged and stored in a cool, dry place. End of story. Um, there's a quote attributed to President Harold B. Lee who said something to the effect, I'll paraphrase, if you knew what I knew, you would pile it, meaning your food storage, in the middle of the room and put a sheet over it and walk around it. Mm. Unquote. That's attributed to him. I don't know if he actually said it, but it's, it's an interesting thought. It's like, how serious are you? Um, and are you going to use that as an excuse? And, and we've all been starving students for some phase uh, in life like that where you build your bookshelves out of food storage and, you know, there's places you can put this. How much does it cost? That's another question. And we've, we've been told that we're not to go to extremes. We should be prudent. We should be wise. We should not go into debt so that it doesn't become a financial burden. Elder Cook, uh, two years ago, talked about uh, uh, stumbling blocks looking beyond the mark. And one of them was expensive preparation for end of day scenarios, quote unquote. And so that's the guidance. And so we need to make sure that we're following the guidance that we expect the blessings. So uh, more on this how, um, organize and plan your efforts. This is just a, it doesn't rise to the point of an algorithm. It's just kind of a set of steps that, that makes sense to me. And you sit down, because you know your why, now you can set some goals. You know, what is it you're trying to accomplish? And then take inventory, whether it's you know, line item by line item. That's up to you to decide, but get a sense of what you have and what you don't have. Um, we all have a level of preparedness, uh, but we all, whether it's three weeks or three months or whatever, we all have a level. Find out what it is and where you're at, and then you can do this gap analysis based on what you know we're supposed to have, what you're at. Now you know where you need to go and what you need to accomplish. So uh, this is about finding your starting point or even your new starting point. Maybe I already have three months, but I want to expand it to six or 12 or whatever. There's always a new starting point from, based on where you're at at the moment in time. <clears throat> and then this is, I think is really important is to make and use lists, whether you do it once and that's it or whatever. It's about getting your head around what this project is about. And this list, in my opinion, is like an A to Z list. Don't not put things on it just because you think it's absurd or I would never want that or eat that or whatever. It goes on the list and then you can apply um, what I mentioned earlier. Then you can apply um, common sense, uh, promptings, uh, spiritual impressions, whatever, to how you prioritize the list you know, and what goes where. But now you know. And one of those side benefits to that is as you're walking through the grocery store, and you see something on uh, pennies for a dollar <coughs> sell, you know it's on your list, but it wasn't high on your priority. You know? um, and, you, and you think, well, it's so cheap, and it's on my list, it's down, I'm going to go ahead and get that. But at least you're making a thoughtful decision about that item that you know is there. And this works across the board other than just food. 
it could be other types of preparation, whether it's hygiene, sanitation, or water, whatever. Uh, a great example is, um, and we talked about this in our water seminar, I'm at Goodwill one day, I go there quite regularly, and it's not because I'm a hoarder, it's because I'm looking, I have a list. I know what's on my list. And there is a Berkey water filter, brand new. I didn't even realize that brand new until the Stout mentioned it and pointed it out to me. This was like, what, a $200 thing. About $375. $375 water filter. It hadn't even been opened yet, and it was on sale for like $16. Yeah. And goodwill. And, and now, considered the best on the market. Yeah. Now that was one I, I was going to, yeah, I'm not going to say why. Well, that's way down my list, you know. It's like, of course, I put that in, in the shopping cart and locked it in. You know, it's like I wanted to get to the checkout stand and change the price. But that's my point. It's like whatever it is, and, and it's the same thing with food. If you find a really good sell on beef, for example, or meat, or or whatever uh, freeze dried, you know, items, you can get these flash sales. If you if you'll sign up on these websites, you'll get a, an email for a flash sale, and it's 50% off. It was one a few days ago. It was 74% off for a mixture of freeze dried meat. So. That'd be a time for you to at least to think, you know, well, maybe I want to take advantage of this. So that's what this is about. And I think once that's in play, now your, your conscience, the promptings, the spirit can work on you to move you. But if you don't have anything there, it's like a blank, quiet sheet of paper. How can it move you, you know, out of, out of the space of nothing? So uh, develop your action plan. So how are we going to do this? And this is my outline. This is off the website. Uh, this is the outline. We're going to talk about foods that last 30 years or more, some product recommendations, packaging recommendations, storage conditions, and then some specifics on, on the how-tos. Again, referencing this, the list on this, 15 to 30 year shelf life, this is the list. So if I'm making a list, if, we, if we're true to form here, all those items go on my list. Doesn't mean I'm going to run right out and get them, but I'm going to start figuring a way, how do I do this? I may already have six months of this item and three months of that item, just in what I already have. And so once you figure that out, now you know what you need to go get, and you can start purposely starting to fill in the blank here. So here's a little exercise. Here's a list. I just randomly thought, brainstormed some items. Some of these might be in your three-month pantry, just that you already have, and some of them may not, but if you look at that list and ask the question, how would you prioritize that list for you? Just kind of think about it. And I put Pop-Tarts on there. I don't eat Pop-Tarts, but I know i got grandkids that do. And that might be what she was saying earlier. It's like, um, they wouldn't be happy if we didn't have Pop-Tarts Pop for Pop-Tarts go a long way. <laughs> they might last a long time, too. <laughs> Okay, so uh, with that said, and just and this again, this is the concept. This is how I might prioritize. If I, I just sat down and said, here's the list, how would I rank order those from start to end? And here at the top, this is kind of off my, my name list, you know, the, the staples, because I want to make sure those are getting put away first. But then as you go down here, yeast, fruit, uh, dried uh, eggs, freeze dried, and so on and so forth. And, and there is a method to my madness as I do that. Because I can make my own yeast. It doesn't have to be up here. And you can learn how to do that too. It's called natural yeast. So I can, that's a skill you can learn. Um, vitamin supplements. We, we probably should have those, but I don't know that that's going to sustain life. You know, it's kind of down, down the list of ways. Yeah. Well, and with that then, you know, if your family has food allergies, what are you going to use? And, and uh, like, one of the things I do is chia seeds because nobody has a chia seed allergy and it's high protein. And, and the other thing is uh, vitamin supplements. I used to worry a lot about that. Turns out that sprouts is what actually saved the sailors on the ships. It wasn't lemon. They cooked the lemon juice so much that it killed all the vitamin C. It was the watercress sprouts that actually saved them. And so, you know, there's just different ways to do that. And, and uh, 
So this is not authoritative. This is just kind of an exercise to kind of get you the idea of how would you take that list or any list that's 200 items long and say, where do I start? You know, where, where does my focus? Well, the vast majority of the saints that died in um, winter quarters died of vitamin deficiency, scurry. They died of it. They didn't have any vegetable, any right. way to get it. So vitamins are a very important thing. That's why they have rose garden. But I don't think Pop-Tarts are. No, but I think and, the hard and candy popcorn, might be. popcorn and hard candy, um, in a long-term down thing, you know, it's like it'd be nice to have a little joy for the kids. So that's, that's not off my chart. It's just not at the top. So how do I? How do you decide? There's many criteria and considerations, and, and, and Neil kind of brought this up. It's like, and all of the, and there's probably a list twice this long. Uh, is it a priority on your list? Is, are we doing survival or comfort? What's my financial budget say? Is it on sale? How much labor is involved in, in procuring or putting up this? Is it in or out of season? What's the nutritional value? What is my inventory status? Uh, what storage methods does it require to put this away? Um, can I, can I uh, make use of my timing and multitask? Or is it gonna like, suck me in and, and keep me away from doing other things? Um, is it for my pantry or for long term? What are my personal tastes? Do I want variety? What, what are promptings telling me to do? What skills do I have? How big of a garage or storage space can I put this into? All of these things are going to influence how you prioritize your list and where you go because each one of us is unique. So I hope that point is well made. Um, packaging recommendations. Whatever we do and however we put it up in a way, these are the enemies that we're trying to protect it against. Um, the only one I really don't have on here is time, but that time goes forward for all of us at the same rate. So temperature, moisture, oxygen, light, and pests. If I can protect against those and whatever methods I'm going to use, then I win the game and I, my food can last longer and maintain its nutritional value. And there's, there's rationale to how you do each one of those, because just putting it in, um, just putting it in a Mylar bag and putting it on the shelf, doesn't protect me from pests. Just putting it in a plastic vacuum seal bag doesn't protect me long term because these aren't good permanent long term. These are semi permeable. permeable. So uh, they'll last me for a little while, but for 30 years, no. I'll, I'll show you more of those than that. So. so one of the other items on the website was how to use peaked bottles. Uh, P-E-T-E, -E. and you can tell us a peat bottle, how? Number two. There's, there's an insignia all stamped somewhere on the bottle, usually the bottom is a triangle, and, and you kind of have to look hard and get the shadow, but it'll say P-E-T-E, -E, or some numeral like that. And so this is a pretty sturdy bottle. Um, here's another one. Now what would you not put in those, and what would you put in those? Did you store water in them? No. Because no. mm -hmm. this is, it'll, it's not good. What could you put in that? Beans. Okay, I, I, I had to take a paper bag of salt and like, you know, because it wicked up moisture and hardened and everything. And I, and I realized that, so I, it was just a stroke that hit me one day. It's like, these are square and they're stackable. That's how you buy them, right? And so every time I'm at Costco, I, I get some of these. And when they're done, I rinse them out. <coughs> And what I do is I fill them full of salt. And is that then I a milk put, bottle? Is that milk? This is a milk bottle. Okay. Uh, you can do the same thing with an orange juice, a gallon jug of orange juice. But, but whatever it is, it could be salt, it could be baking powder, it could be baking soda, it could be Epsom salt that you would use in your garden for fertilizer. I mean, whatever dry, it's a dry. You put it in here and then put a desiccant pack in there. And whether you put a plastic bag on it and screw it down tight, or even go one better and take a mylar bag and cut it apart and put the plastic, you know, peel it apart, put the plastic side um, on here and then get your iron and just melt it. And so now you've sealed it on there. You put the cap back on and now you've got, you've got waterproof, you know, you've got pest proof. I mean, I don't know what could hurt salt, but there's other dry foods that you could maybe figure out what to put in here in bulk. 
Salt lasts forever. But the other things, like if you put beans in there. I think that if I had a bag of baking soda, you can buy them in four pound bags at Costco. If I had a bulk amount and I filled a couple of those up with baking soda and I put, did this to it, it's going to last longer in that than it would in its original packaging. So I'm, I'm not too worried. But now I've got moisture. If my, if my garage floods or something or the basement floods, you know, I didn't lose all my dry stuff. You worry about how well that container's cleaned out? Yeah, you want to clean it out, put a little drop of Dawn or something in it, mix it up, and then and I leave them in my garage open for about a week. I want to make sure it's totally dry, and then I can fill it. So that's just an idea, but this is off. This is straight off the website. So these so people. Her question. Her question was about beans. Could you put beans in one of those sure. and store those? And how long would that last? Do you think? Um, Probably thirty. Could you get thirty years? Now? I would trust it in a different storage vehicle before I would in a plastic bottle. But I think you've got a good, like, the time there. So shorter term. It's more of a year term. or five yeah. years or something. Cornmeal, you know, you know, flour, I mean, things that you might want to be in and out of. Rice. Maybe. Rice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those big bags at Costco, and they, they don't come in. But, I, but I think for the bulk yeah. items, like beans, rice, and so forth, I think there's better ways. Mm -hmm. I'll, and I'll tell you about what I think is a better way. Yeah. You're not going to have a 50 or 100 pound bag of baking soda, yeah. you know. Okay, so oxygen absorbers and desiccants. So this is, these are uh, oxygen absorbers. It's in, uh, uh, I have these, I, I cut my finger, do you wanna listen to this? Don't bend the lid. <laughs> I'm not gonna bend the lid. Can he do it? Wow. Okay, so how did that happen? To fall out. Yeah. So there's an oxygen absorber. So you get a food saver thing. You stick it on there. And you use your food saver or whatever you want. It. This will make a little noise. While that's doing that, this is freeze dried beef. Things, and it's the same thing that run in the middle of making chili. And here's my chili. I make my own chili seasoning. You just you can go get and buy it and make both because I'm going to do lots of these. And so it's the same thing. I don't think that stops you have the joy of putting it. Use four fingernails, by the way. There you go. So. That's down there, and that's that's chili. So the desiccants, um, I'll pass these around. These are these are spent. By the way, it's chili. It's chili. These are spent. I'll just pass them around. These are different sizes. How old is this? How old? Uh, how old? Um, I made it about two months ago. Oh, okay. Smells so here's some. Uh, these are spent, but you know, if you feel them, they're they're grainy and sometimes they'll turn red. These are new ones. This is a hundred cc's. Um, these are three hundred cc's. And there's 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 rules here for um, a um, a three hundred cc goes in a gallon or a number ten can. A one hundred cc, which is the smaller one coming around. Um, is good for a quart or pint bag. And if you're doing a bucket, you'll need 2,000. So you need about seven of the 300s, or you can buy them in a large thing of 2,000 cc's. These are desiccants, this is silica. And I, I've developed my own rules about how to use these. Those, those are the kind of things when you buy in a piece of electronics, you put a silica bag in there to wick up moisture. Um, I just buy a big bag of these. And uh, you combine the two, de desiccant and oxygen. I do, when but I don't. One if I put them in a bag, I don't let them touch. I put them on opposite sides of whatever I've got in there. I read somewhere where that's an important rule. And the other thing that I don't like to do is put them in 
This is a riceroni mill in a bag, which we'll talk more. I violated my rule, but this was early on. So see, this is all loose in here. And I've got a desiccant bag, so the question happens, what if the desiccant bag tears or rips and the silica gets out into the rice? And I, I, that's not desirable. And so I don't put it when it's loose anymore. What I do is I use them when I'm pre-packaging and I'll show you that in a minute, but this is a <coughs> chili mill in the bag. And you can see I've got the two in there. And I'm not worried because everything in there is prepackaged. It's isolated, so if... Does it work, though? Oh, well, you've got a double bag. Yeah, they are kind of double bagged in a way. So How does it, if it's not in the same bag, it still works? Whatever's, inside, whatever's inside that space, Okay. There's no oxygen in here, okay. and this is controlling any moisture that might be in some of the dehydrated or dry foods. Even though it's in another bag, it will still do it. Right. So are those other bags in there sealed? No. Okay. I'll show you how I do that here in just a moment. How, just how do you know when an oxygen absorber is spent? How did you say? Pardon? How did you know when an oxygen absorber is done? It, um, it changes color. It's, it's iron oxide, so it kind of rusts, turns reddish, plus it's, it turns hard and granulate. It's not soft and floury. Plus, if it's if you if, if we open one of those and just left them out, it would turn it would, within about 10, 15 minutes. It would start to get really warm, and you kind of want to use them within 10 to 20 minutes. And, or what I do is I pull some out. Like I'll, if I've got several, I'm going to do. I'll pull those out and then we seal this. See that's back on there now, so there's no. Yeah, when we used to go over and work at the thing, you know, packaging our own stuff, they would have us. Keep the bag sealed when we, yep. we take some out and then like, yep. you use what you need for what you right. can use in the first 10 15 minutes and then get more out and so forth. So it stays. Um, <clears throat> so, Lee, real quick on those, so you have the package there of the oxygen absorbers. Once you open that package, you have to use those almost within the next 10 to 15 minutes, or does it go bad? No. You have okay. to reseal them. Okay. So I, let, let's if say you, I, if you left, you couldn't like open them and then leave them open for a day or two. No. And then, no. If you haven't used them in ten minutes, so my point is, I know I'm going to use ten or fifteen. You know, I've yeah. got ten or fifteen things I'm going to put it in. So I'll get them all ready, and then I'll open the oxygen absorber, drop them all in, and reseal the <laughs> oxygen thing, and then start processing the bags. Okay. That way, my source doesn't go away on me. Is that the same with the desiccant? No. Oh. No, you, and you can recharge those. You can put those in your oven at 200 or in a dehydrator and recharge them and drive all the moisture out. If you, if you have to left, left those out and humidity got to them or something, you can recharge them. So, so the desiccants absorb moisture and the oxygen absorbers do the oxygen. So that, that right? That's so correct. <laughs> Only oxygen. Okay. Which is why someone says, well, you didn't suck all the air out of that. And you're right, but all the oxygen's handled. The, what's in there is nitrogen and argon and the other parts of air. Would it be preferable to suck all the air out of that? No. And the reason why is because there's Sharpies in here that could pierce or puncture the bag. So how do you just adjust your suction? To Very carefully air? fill that. Those are dehydrated potatoes. You feel how sharp those are? Yeah. Those are like thorns. And so you don't suck that down or you're going to have 20 How do you holes. stop it where you want it? Just you shut just, it off? Yeah, you just shut it off. Air, pull air some of the air out and not all of it. Yep. And then there's a little bit of an arc to that, but you'll figure it out as you go. Can I ask you a quick question? You said about the oxygen absorbers, the 300 cc ones were for what size? One gallon. The, they're for the number 10 cans, like oh. we used to can or we still can. Okay. Can can. And if you use the five gallon bucket, you said you want seven of them. You want two thousand. Oh, so okay. you whatever combination you put, you want to get two thousand cc's in a five gallon bucket. Okay. And how about the desiccant then? I, it depends on what you're doing. If you've okay. got to do it, it's not the desiccant is less critical. Okay. Okay. But if you were, let's say that we were living in the south, and humidity was a real problem. And you're out in your garage and you've got your sweat and there's humidity and you're putting food up. 
and you're thinking, I open a dry goods bag of something up, and it starts wicking in 95% humidity immediately. So you got to work quickly or do something to counter the moisture that's being absorbed. Yeah, okay. Foil pouches. <clears throat> now these are mylar. I made the point earlier that I made the point earlier that these uh, vacuum seal plastic bags, and we'll talk more about them, uh, are semi-permeable. So they're good for a little while, but ultimately you want them in a mylar bag. These are the one gallon size off the church site, and these are the best value I've seen anywhere. You can't really buy, you can buy these elsewhere, but this is the best value. And, and the inside is plastic, and the outside is foil. And so when you seal this, you're going to use a heat device to, to seal across here and melt the plastic together. And when you've got that done, and the food's in here, whatever's in, and you've sealed it, and you put your whatever you need, your oxygen absorber thing or whatever, you seal that, this now is protected from light, moisture, oxygen, not pests, not mice, and not mice. So that's because there's still got to be something else you have to do. But, but those are the biggies. Okay, so I got that part done. There's different kinds here. You can buy them with um, the Ziploc uh, thing. So if you open this up, I've got a bin full of uh, uh, Brigham tea. I'd like to have several more bins of other kinds of herbs, but individual, you know, Brigham tea in there for. Someday if I ever need it for colds and flus and whatever. So that's a great size for